Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. There are a lot of papers that are written by scientists that don't reach the public, partly because they might be in too scientific a journal, or maybe they're in language that the average person doesn't want to sit down and actually read. But I think that this is a very, very important paper, and it was published by the CO2 Coalition, and I'd just like to read it to you, and then you can also listen to it as a podcast if you want. It'll give you an idea of some of the anomalies and some of the uh, issues with what's called the global average temperature. So this paper was written by Professor Richard Linson and John Christie, and I think that it will give you some insights into the climate change discussion and might actually calm you down a bit if you're feeling very concerned that there's some kind of a climate catastrophe going on. So let me just get on with the show. Here is the preface. The purpose of this paper is to explain how the data set that is referred to by policymakers and the media as the global surface temperature record is actually obtained and where it fits into the popular narrative associated with climate alarm. So first, let's look at the executive summary. At the center of most discussions of global warming is the record of the global mean surface temperature anomaly often somewhat misleadingly referred to as the global mean temperature record. This paper addresses two aspects of this record. First, we note that this record is only one link in a fairly long chain of inference leading to the claimed need for worldwide reduction in carbon dioxide CO2 emissions. Second, we explore the implications of the way the record is constructed and presented and show why the record is misleading. This is because the record is often treated as a kind of single direct instrumental measurement. However, as the late Stan Grotch of the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory pointed out 30 years ago, it's really the average of widely scattered station data, where the actual data points are almost evenly spread between large positive and negative values. The average is simply the small difference of these positive and negative excursions with the usual problem associated with small differences of large numbers. At least thus far, the approximately one degree Celsius increase in the global mean since 1900 is swamped by the normal variations at individual stations and so bears little relation to what is actually going on at a particular one. The changes at the stations are distributed around the one degree global average increase. Even if a single station had recorded this increase itself, this would take a typical annual range of temperature there, for example, from minus 10 to 40 degrees in 1900 and replace it with a range today of minus 9 to 41. People, crops, and weather at that station would find it hard to tell this difference. However, the increase looks significant on the charts used in almost all presentations because they omit the range of the original data points and they expand the scale in order to make the mean change look large. The record does display certain consistent trends, but it's also quite noisy, and fluctuations of a tenth or two of a degree are unlikely to be significant. In the public discourse, little attention is paid to magnitudes. The focus is rather on whether this anomaly is increasing or decreasing. Given the noise and sampling errors, it's rather easy to adjust such averaging and even change the sign of a trend from positive to negative. The common presentations often suppress the noise by using running averages over periods from 5 to 11 years. However, such processing can also suppress meaningful features such as the wide variations that are always being experienced at individual stations. Finally, we show the large natural temperature changes that Americans in 14 major cities must cope with every year. 
For example, the average difference between the coldest and the warmest moments each year ranges from about 25 degrees Celsius in Miami, or 45 degree Fahrenheit change, to 55 degrees in Denver, a 99 degree Fahrenheit change. We contrast this with the easily manageable 1.2 degrees Celsius increase in the global mean temperature anomaly in the past 120 years, which has caused so much alarm in the media and in policy circles. Number one, the global temperature record and its role. The Earth's climate system is notoriously complex. We know, for example, that this system undergoes multi-year variations without any external forcing at all, other than the steady component of the sun's radiation, for example, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and the quasi-biennial oscillation of the tropical stratosphere. We know, moreover, that these changes are hardly describable simply by some global me measurement of temperature. Indeed, what is presented is actually something else. You may have noticed that it's referred to as the global mean temperature anomaly. What is being averaged is the deviation of the surface mean from some 30-year mean at stations non-randomly scattered around the globe. As we'll soon see, this average bears rather little relation to the changes at the individual stations. And moreover, as noted by Christie and McNider in 2017, the temperature anomaly of the lower troposphere, measured by satellites, relative to surface temperatures, is much better sampled, and it represents the more climate-relevant quantity of heat content, a change in which is a theorized consequence of enhanced GHG greenhouse gas forcing. However imprecise and lightly relevant the surface temperature is to the physics of the issue, the narrative of a global warming disaster uses the record as the first in a sequence of often com comparably questionable assumptions. The narrative first claims that changes in this dubious metric are almost entirely due to variations in carbon dioxide, CO2, even though there are quite a few other factors whose common variations are as large or larger than the impact of changes in CO2. For example, modest changes in the area of upper and lower level clouds, or changes in the height of upper level clouds. Then the narrative asserts that changes in CO2 were primarily due to man's activities. There is indeed evidence that this link is likely true for changes over the past 200 years. However, over Earth's history, there were radical changes in CO2 levels, and these changes were largely uncorrelated with changes in temperature. The narrative further assumes that we know precisely how to control the level of CO2 and that we know exactly how this will influence the global average temperature anomaly. Finally, perhaps the most questionable claim is that all of this implies the likelihood of existential disaster unless the assumed control measures are implemented. In a logical world, it would be understood that the probability of the whole chain will be the product of the probability of each link, and so generally very small. And of course, if any link is broken, i.e. probability zero, the whole chain is broken. This is even part of folk wisdom. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Why then, amongst all these mostly very weak links, should we focus on the record of surface temperature anomalies? Well, part of the reason is that it's simply interesting to see how this record is assembled. However, there is also the fact that in the world of environmental alarm, the above logic is turned upside down, and the existence of any link is held to imply the likelihood of the whole chain of inference, including the promotion of catastrophism. This step specifically ignores that this is not an issue that depends simply on whether the temperature is increasing or not, but rather on 
how much? As noted by Lindsay and Spencer in 2019, presently estimated changes in the temperature record are mostly consistent with low sensitivity to increases in CO2, and the related warming is likely to be beneficial. The notion that society is willing to waste trillions of dollars to avoid benefits is sobering. Two, presentations of the global mean temperature anomaly record. As we have noted, the globally average temperature anomaly is the average of changes from a 30-year mean at each measuring station. Depending on the time resolution one wants, one may use seasonally or annually averaged anomalies. The latter is shown in figure one, and the former is shown in figure two. In each, we see a dense scatter of points. In figure one, these points cover a range of about eight degrees. In figure two, this range is larger, about 18 degrees. In figures three and four, we show the area weighted global averages of the station and ocean data superimposed on the scatter plots. Clearly, the global means are the small residues of the almost equal number of stations with cooling and warming. Hence, the mean is a pretty useless indicator of what's going on locally. In order to obscure the fact that the global means are small residues of large numbers whose precision is questionable, the common presentations plot the mean anomalies without the scattered points, and they expand the scale so as to make the changes look large. These expanded graphs of global means are shown in figures five and six. The frequently cited trends are evident in these graphs, most notably the pre-CO2 warming from 1920 to 1940, and the warming that has been attributed to man from 1978 to 1998. We also see a reduced rate from 1998, which is best seen in figure six, until the major El Nino of 2016 occurred. Even if one could attribute all of the 1978 to 1998 warming to the increases in CO2, the slowdown clearly shows that there's something going on that is at least as large as the response to CO2. This contradicts the IPCC attribution studies that assume, based on model results, that other sources of variability since 1950 are negligible. Note that the results in figure five and six are quite noisy, with large interseasonal and interannual fluctuations. This noise contributes to the uncertainty of the values, in addition to the usual sampling errors. The graphs one usually sees are a lot smoother looking than what we see in figures five and six. These have resulted from taking running means over five or more years. The results of such smoothing are shown in figure seven, smoothed over 11 years, and figure eight, smoothed over 21 seasons, or about five years. They look much cleaner and presumably more authoritative than the unsmoothed results or the scatter diagrams, but this tends to disguise the uncertainty, which is likely on the order of 0.1 to 0.2 degrees. For example, figure seven substantially disguises the pause following 1998. Figure eight does this less because it's averaged over only about five years. Obviously, warmings or coolings of a tenth or two of a degree are without significance since possible adjustments can easily lead to changes of sign from positive to negative. Yet in the popular literature, much is made of such small changes. Like with sausage, you might not want to know what went into these graphs, but in this case, it's important that you do. Some concluding remarks. An examination of the data that goes into calculating the global mean temperature anomaly clearly shows that any place on Earth is almost as likely at any given time to be warmer or cooler than average, 
The anomaly is the small residue of the generally larger excursions we saw in figures one and two. This residue, which is popularly held to represent climate, is also much smaller than the temperature variations that all life on Earth regularly experiences. Figure 9 illustrates this for 14 major cities in the United States. Indeed, the 1.2 degrees Celsius global temperature change in the past 120 years, depicted as alarming in figure 7, is only equivalent to the thickness of the average line in figure 9. As the figure shows, the differences in average temperature from January to July in these major cities ranges from just under 10 degrees in Los Angeles to nearly 30 degrees in Chicago. And the average difference between the coldest and warmest moments each year ranges from about 25 degrees in Miami, a 45 degree Fahrenheit change, to 55 degrees in Denver, a 99 degree Fahrenheit change. At the very least, we should keep the large natural changes in Figure 9 in mind and not attribute them to the small residue, the global mean temperature anomaly, or obsess over its small changes. If you'd like to read the full report, it's on the CO2 Coalition website. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. <laughs>